Uh, thanks for everybody for uh, for being here. Um, thank you for uh, buying the book if you're going to buy it, reading the book, hopefully if you have or if you plan to. I look forward to taking all of your questions. Um, I guess I thought I'd talk for, uh, for a little while. Um, something I also like to do, uh, you know, we have a small group here. Feel free to fill in if you want. But um, can I ask how many of you watch CNBC? So uh, many of you are CNBC viewers. Um, we usually have a pretty educated viewership. So I'm curious. I tend to like to do this in small groups or large groups. How many of you think the economy is seen, the, seen its worst days? It's going to improve. Okay. Um, how many of you uh, think that we will see economic growth in 2010? Not just GDP being flat, but actual growth. All right, so not, not too optimistic. Uh, we're in New York. I'm just curious how many of you think we're in for a very tough time here in New York, or perhaps we've also seen the worst of it. Uh, who thinks we've seen the worst of it? Okay. Uh, finally, how many of you think Joe Kernan's hair is real? <laughs> Nobody? Nobody? I'll tell you at the end. You got to stay. <laughs> uh, I wrote the book. Uh, many of you may have seen. I don't know if you haven't. It, it's still airing. Um, our documentary, House of Cards. We spent over a year on that documentary. It was late 2007. I had a lot of people uh, who I'd been speaking to. I began as a banking reporter in um, 1987. One of the advantages of doing something for a very long time and getting older is so do your sources. They move up in the institutions where they are um, working, and many of them are senior executives at many of our nation's banks. Beginning in August of 2007, almost two years ago to right now, uh, when the credit crisis sort of began, uh, many of them were telling me, David, this is going to be very, very bad. And yet, if you recall, the stock market did not reflect that at all through the fall of 2007, uh, right through October, November. Uh, things were quite good. I think we were hitting our all-time highs uh, in the stock market. But I had this chorus of people who said the stock market doesn't get it. The credit markets are not functioning. Uh, we are going to have a serious, significant recession. And we started to see a lot of different elements of that, though, in the equity markets, as I said, things were not being reflected. And so I decided at that time that it might be appropriate to begin uh, work on a documentary. Uh, and so we did. Uh, and that process took 13 or 14 months, and that documentary aired. Its name was uh, is House of Cards. It aired in February of this year, 2009. Um, Documentaries are great. They're a lot better than being able to report on something for two minutes. But even they have their limitations, as generous as CNBC has been to me in giving me the time we need to try and tell an important story. House of Cards was two hours or an hour and 22 minutes, of course, you have advertising. Um, but uh, there are still so many more things, I think, that were left to, to say about this crisis and so many more dots to connect for people. Obviously, not nearly as many people, unfortunately, read books as watch television. And so while millions of people have seen the documentary, far fewer will read the book. But nonetheless, I felt like there was going to be an interest in trying to understand in a broader context what happened, uh, how it happened, and delving in in a bit more detail in some of those somewhat complex uh, topics such as collateralized debt obligations. Um, which I've devoted a chapter to in the book, and hopefully it's not too tough for people to understand. It's funny, a lot of Wall Street people have read the book and come back to me and said, you know, I thought I got it, but I only really understood how they were constructed, um, the risk that was inherent in them, and actually how it all worked until I, until I read your book. Something else I thought was important to do was try and explain to people how the banks ultimately suffered the losses that they did. Um, I think we did that to a certain extent in the documentary, but again, in a book, you get a lot more opportunity to go into a, a good level of detail without hopefully boring the reader. It's only about 185 pages long. Um, and I use Merrill Lynch as an example. I might have used Bear Stearns. I might have used Lehman Brothers or Citigroup. But Merrill, uh, being the great firm that it was, and of course being on its knees uh, as well last September 14th, 
ultimately sold to Bank America, I thought would make a good example. And so um, that's what I tried to do in the book. And uh, there are any number of different things that I think uh, um, are significant in terms of the focus, but um, you know, other things that I that I was trying to do were to combat some of the I think myths that are out there uh, that have been propagated. For example, um, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac caused the economic crisis or caused the credit crisis. This has been something that's been bandied about, certainly in political circles, um, and it's really not true. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did many wrong things, but ultimately, if you read the book, um, I think I try and explain that it was, in fact, their absence from the market for mortgages that allowed Wall Street to move in and ultimately caused so many of the problems that we currently are still suffering from, uh, rather than their irresponsibility in terms of offering subprime mortgages and the like. What Fannie and Freddie did was try to gain back market share that they ultimately had lost to Wall Street. Um, as you can judge from the title, of course, I do point the finger squarely at Wall Street in a lot of ways. Um, I do think Wall Street, there are many culprits, many, many culprits, uh, but Wall Street certainly, I think, is chief amongst them. Um, a lack of leadership amongst so many of the firms and their, their leaders, a lack of understanding of the risk that was being taken on by so many of these firms. Uh, again, as I said, I focus on Merrill Lynch and Stan O'Neill, very tough but very smart man who ran that firm with an iron fist for a number of years but ultimately was forced to resign um, in October of, of 2007. He's a, an interesting story, um, is O'Neill, but what I've uncovered in my reporting on Merrill is he really did not fully understand, not even close, frankly, uh, the risk that was being undertaken by the firm that he ran. It may have been kept from him in part by the people who ran fixed income. Mortgages, mortgage-related products uh, became by far the largest engine of growth at Merrill Lynch. It was, as I say, sort of the largest mortgage broker masquerading as an investment bank in our country. Uh, and yet O'Neill didn't fully come to grips with that fact until the summer of 2007, until this period I've already mentioned, August of 2007, when he embarked on uh, what has been a much remarked on uh, solo golfing excursion, essentially, taking days in late August and September of 2007 alone playing golf. Many people wondering, well, why in the world would Stan O'Neill be doing that while it seemed the world was starting to melt down? Um, I believe it was because he finally understood that his firm was in serious, serious trouble and he was trying to collect his thoughts and figure out what to do. Ultimately, a year later, Merrill Lynch would be sold to Bank America for about $40 billion in a deal that's still being looked at very carefully by regulators. If any of you have watched television and seen these hearings where Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke get up and have to testify in front of Congress, why they spent so much time on this is, is not quite clear to me. But nonetheless, Bank America did pay an enormous price. Uh, it would seem for Merrill Lynch, a firm that very well may have collapsed on September 15th or September 16th uh, of last year if it had not been for Bank America um, coming in. Uh, things seem a lot better these days. You know, I wrote the epilogue to this book in, in the spring of this year, and it's funny how quickly things seem to have changed, but I'm not sure that they truly have. Uh, we are still going to be suffering from at least 10 percent unemployment for some time to come. We've seen a complete retrenchment of the consumer uh, in our country at this point. And there are so, so many questions um, about whether this recovery that seems to be reflected in the Dow Jones Industrial Average being at 9,200 uh, is real. Um, Goldman Sachs, of course, is back to making a lot of money, perhaps taking on a lot of risk. Uh, but Wall Street is changed. Whether it's changed forever, of course, is a larger question, or even changed significantly is a question. I have, find myself with uh, far too many questions these days and, and not many answers um, in terms of those larger issues as to whether Wall Street is truly going to reform itself or has been or will be as a result of the regulatory actions that are being undertaken by the Obama administration or they, they hope to undertake.